recording and okay so this is a um recording for the cauldron and i'm going to be explaining some of the content we went over um and i'm going to be using a example of a counterfactual from ukraine so um, it's the idea that what happens to Ukraine if Trump becomes president? Um, and this is weaving in what we learned from our paper on tense logic using modal logic. Um, so it is a metaphysical argument. Um, and we will be going through it. And we have an appearance right next. Come here. Here's next. I know. So we will be going over the counterfactual case where um, uh, I can explain some of the evidence. Um, the counterfactual case where Donald Trump is president using modal logic. So let's. You want to make another appearance? What do you have to say? You have something to say? Yes, I am a kitty cat. Maybe that's what it's like. Thank you. So our star made an appearance. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to share the screen and we're going to go over it. Okay, so um Hopefully you can see that. Um, this is the one we want. Hey, hey, hey. I do not know why they did that. Cut it out, guys. Cut it out. That is very abnormal for them. Okay, so let's go through um, counterfactual. So the first thing to note is um, that there are only uh, there are only going to be a certain type of world possible, um, and that was just in the, in the introduction of the metaphysics piece. Um, so let's go through that. You start at the beginning um, and it says here, the tale of tense logic. So tense logic is a variety of temporal logic and is a branch of modal logic. So you might be like, what is modal logic? Um, well, very, to be short, uh, modal logic is the logic of modes. So these are different ways things can exist. Um, but we'll kind of go through a few kinds of purely symbolic logic. Um, so the first one we have here is our ominous, which is this upside down A. That means for all. Um, or it can be the class of all. And it's also called the universal, but omnis is Latin for, if you know Latin, <laughs> you can know it's omniscient, which is um, able to classify all into something. Um, so omniscience is, of course, the idea that there exists something that knows all. And that's a presupposition when we apply it to logic that this class of whatever I'm referring to knows all. So what you'll usually see is this upside down A next to an X. So that's saying for all X. So on this X. So I know all about X and that is the complete square. Can you ever know that? That was in our original 
um, discussion. And then there's the nullum, which is simply ominous negated. So you see the sideways L, that's the negation. And the quidem, which is the uh, existent, you can see the extent. It just means for one or there exists one. And then the nullum is, i sorry, the quidem non. It, it's just essentially non means not one um, put them and so that means that there is not one of that um so now this is more pertinent is down the line these are your impossible impossible worlds um so there is the square and that is going to be your necessary um and of course the negation is the not, not necessary. So when we say necessary, um, it means something so uh, fundamental to the world that its lack of existence would mean that the world's construction would fall away. So space time is usually a necessary thing for human cognizance. So if I have, if I propose a world that is cognizable, cognizable to a human, um, then we say, uh, then we say it's necessary that um, it is in space time because anything that is in space time has to, um, has to, uh, well, anything that is cognizable to a human has to be in space time. So. We see that that's a necessary and fundamental construct of any world that is human, uh, cognizable to a human. And then we have, uh, right there, we have the uh, possible diamond. Um, and the diamond simply means that uh, it's possible that it is the case. So um, these are the things that don't necessarily happen. Um, so if you say I've, it's possible that France is underwater in 4,080. Um, it's not necessary. I mean, maybe we saw global warming, maybe never global warming never reaches the threshold we think it will. Uh, who knows? It just is possible, right? And usually the method we establish for possibility is that if I can think of it, it's at least possible. Is it probable? I think not, um, but Usually we say that. So other ones are geontic. So obligatory is the fundamental and it's opposite is optional. So we're right here. Obligatory is anything that must happen and optional is something that doesn't necessarily have to happen. Permitted and forbidden. So something can be allowed or it could be you know, it couldn't be allowed to happen, but it doesn't necessarily happen. Um, forbidden is, it is not allowed, but it also doesn't necessarily have to happen. Um, so they're very similar to your possibility and necessity. Um, whether or not our honest and alone, quid on, quid on non are analogous to any of the necessaries, um, you know, I don't know if you make that kind of stretch, but the deontic is specifically meant to take away any sort of greater assumption, um, and it, like greater ontological assumption, and it's meant to um, bring it down to obligatory, optional, forbidden, and permitted. And they do talk about that later in this, but I'm making this specifically about um, the counterfactuals in Ukraine. So let's talk about uh, so I'm here and um, we're going to talk about just trying to remember where I was. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about this. So NATO was definitely one of the biggest factors here. Um, and what is NATO? Well, it's a essentially a trade organization. Um, 
and it is meant to secure the uh, security architecture of Europe primarily, but the United States is also part of it. And, um, you know, Russia um, has had an issue and there has been expansion, but essentially the number one thing to note is Ukraine is currently not part of NATO. Um, so let's read this. The perceived threat of NATO expansion is easy to cite as a proximate cause of the Ukraine war, but we could have avoided the war if NATO had not expanded at all. Would the war be waged then in the Baltic states or Poland instead of Russia's development have been what it was has been? Um, if Russia's development had been what it has been. The enlargement of NATO can be seen as a meaningful counterfactual because it was not inevitable, at least not in the mid 1990s. Okay, so this is a really important counterfactual. And <clears throat> why is that? It's um, because of the risk management arguments that we hear being made across the world. So one of the things that um, you'll hear, especially uh, from maybe the German state is that you shouldn't invest in Ukraine because of the risk of how Russia will perceive it. Um, but of course, that's a very short term fear based argument that, you know, the president of Ukraine, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, has repeatedly said, of course, you cannot ensure that even if we were to give up territory, that it would stop there. So let's kind of go over. Um, Let's go over a little bit of uh, the look at the geography of the situation. Um, so we've got Poland and we've got Ukraine and we've got Russia. And we all want those on the map. Um, so taking a look, we see here this is a good one. To a nice wide picture. There's Russia, there's Ukraine, and there's Poland. And if you're like, well, why are you just looking over Belarus? Well, Belarus is known to be very much in the pocket of Putin already. Um, so the two that are really holding off on Russia coming into Europe, which is over here, um, is going to be um, is going to be Poland and Ukraine. And Poland's not getting a lot of it. Like it's not great to be the neighbor of Belarus, I'm sure, but it's you know worse to be the neighbor strictly of Russia. So that is your Ukraine situation. Um, Crimea was the area that was next, um, and that has a lot to do with the um, what you have here, which is your Black Sea. Um, and the reason that is is because this is used as a waterway and you can actually transport. Um, I think Zelensky had a pretty awesome program where he was. Uh, exporting grain despite a block into Africa. So he's going through here. Um, and there was a lot of issues about the Black Sea and these passageways in particular being up for contention and people starving because of the war. But anyway, so the idea is that if Ukraine were to fall, and we do not want that, but what's to say that Poland wouldn't be next, right? Okay, so then we look and we say, well, if it is possible that Poland could be next, um, is it necessary? Well, let's take a look. Would the war be waged then in the Baltic states of Poland instead of Russia, uh, if Russia's development had been what it has been? Um, the enlargement of NATO has been a meaningful counterfactual, which means a world counter to the facts of the world as they stand, because it was not inevitable, at least not in the mid 1990s. So what made two things we want to think about to, to understand necessity, two things you want to understand is what made, um, what made it necessary to develop NATO. Um, and if Ukraine were to be given up on, um, what is stopping 
Poland from being protected by this NATO system, right? So let's keep going. The idea was contested and it did not have widespread support in Washington to begin with. Yet the desire of the former people's democracies in East Central Europe to join NATO did not wane that easily and the pressure for expansion would have remained had President Clinton not adopted the pro-enlargement policy. Okay. Um, so what they're saying is even if even if there had not been a Clinton push for these things to happen, there was still a significant desire for NATO to span. Um, so why why is that? So then we're going to go with Poland again. And um, so let's take a look here. It's starting at the top and it says, what is the historical truth concerning promises not to expand NATO? Some of the actors involved, like Edward Shevardnadze, have later denied the existence of any promise, while some disagree completely. Um, so he recalls that the Soviets were reassured that after during the unification, NATO would be extended any further than the East, would not be. According to a meticulous analysis made by Der Spiegel, there is no doubt that Western leadership did everything they could to give the impression that NATO membership was out of the, uh, the question for countries like Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. Um, so, moreover, from the viewpoint of Russia, NATO expansion reveals the nature of Western actors. That, this has often been interpreted um, in Russia via a particularly misleading historical analogy to Operation Barbosa, which is, of course, when Hitler tried to um, invade Russia, which ultimately led to the death of some 30 million Soviet citizens. Okay. So now you can probably see two things happening. Um, first is that Germany genuinely didn't want to offer countries just coming out of the Soviet Union, the possibility to join NATO. Why would that be? That is an interesting question. Um, on the other hand, um, Russia is looking at it as because of that original exclusion that you can kind of see um, why did they not want them to join NATO? Well, maybe there is a little bit of ethnicism in there, right? So even if they're becoming democratic, they're still being abandoned because they can't join the culture as it stood in Russia, but then they also can't be really deemed, um, you know, as human as it takes to be in NATO. So it's a rock and a hard place for countries like Poland and Ukraine, right? So. Um, it was only after pushes from like a lot of the European states and the US and they said, we need this because we need to act as a unit and we need to, um, you know, they always say the security architecture of Ukraine. We needed to make Ukraine have a strong, um, uh, we need to make Europe have a strong security architecture. And that was the main reason for absorbing these countries. And they're saying, well, Interesting that now you want to do that when previously you were just like assuring people that you wouldn't do that. Um, and that seems like the change is more to do with greed and conquering than it is to do with genuinely um, solidifying the continent. Because if that were true, then immediately they would have extended a hand to Poland and Ukraine and all of those. So it's really hard for these countries because there is some truth to um, there is some truth to it insofar as the reunified Germany it was not immediately inclusive um, of the old fallen Soviet states, even if they wanted to change, even if they saw the appeal and they were interested. Like we just saw, they had their own push into, um, they had their own push to join. So 
it's really hard when you are a country that can see the brokenness of the Soviet system and can see how it made people corrupt and uh, how it made people um, engage in crime and not say anything at fear of losing their place in the group. And then seeing other models such as, you know, German models, which are strong, like Germany is known for being a stable and financially well off state and seeing how that relates to democracy and wanting that for yourself. Um, and then being told you can't have it because of very covertly ethnicist, um, uh, ethnicist background. So it's very interesting for me because I have German and I have Polish. So, um, it, you know, to me, it's like, of course they're compatible. Of course you can do it, but that's not how you know, the old guard of Hitler saw it, saw it who well, he was like an extreme ethnicist. And of course he typed the white race um, into Aryans and Anglos and all that. So he did say that Aryans are um, far superior to the Slavs. And, um, you know, a lot of this hesitancy to work with Poland and Ukraine is the idea that the blood of the Aryan will be tainted um and to the say there are still covert signs that you know like somebody might not want to you know work with someone with blue eyes because they say oh i don't feel comfortable with someone who doesn't appear Aryan." and it's like uh, you know somebody in german might in germany might say that which is patently ridiculous because there were um there were more asiatic ethnicities that were coming into the area um there were you know there's surrounding you've got all sorts of different ethnicities um so the whole thing was just very very confused um we were just desperate to have something to cling to at the time germany was just being completely humiliated economically um, by reparations and what happens when people are uh, completely humiliated is they hang on to the one thing they can that makes them feel uh dignity again and that happened to be the one thing that made them different from the places that were humiliating them, like the Anglos of um, the Anglos of England, and I think it's the Saxons of France. Now, somebody can correct me on what the French race was, but essentially, the idea was that um, you know this one thing that made them different would be a point of dignity and. Was started out as a way to uh, reissue dignity, became psychotic because they had not much left in, in them except for this one thing, and it just became hyper ethnicism. So, one of the things to note is humiliation of that severe, uh, a uh, you know, attempt uh, tends to create a really adverse reaction um, that gets psychotic because it's just already based on like nothing and they just extrapolate it. So, um, so that's what's happening there. So let's go back to the metaphysics part of it. Um, so why does it matter that we know this? Well, we know that the Trump presidency is coming up and we know that the Republicans are thinking of withdrawing aid from Ukraine and that Biden has now gone, undergone an impeachment, potential impeachment. So what we see there is, um, Biden is seen next to Ukraine. Um, Ukrainian funding is getting pulled and it's mainly the GOP trying to get Biden out. Um, so argument pretty clearly is, unfortunately, a lot of Russian sentiment inside of the uh, GOP. And there is a very recent article that says, I'm ashamed to say it, but it seems the GOP is, um, is a, uh, it's the party of the Russians, right? And that was part of Biden's speech when Zelensky came in. Um, he said that, uh, he did say, if the if a Kremlin-backed um, news source is going to say, um, great job and what you did will help Russia, then it's probably the case that, um, 
maybe you're not acting in your country's best interest because your country's best interests are supposed to be aligned with NATO um, because that is a way to help with the Western standard way of engaging in trade and securing the security architecture of Europe. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, so the interesting thing is that if Trump becomes president, right? And now Ukraine is not getting as much funding or maybe none um, because Trump is known for having He's known for having what is called a uh, non-interference policy. So he wants to focus on domestic affairs and doesn't believe, or oh, non-interventionist, sorry. He doesn't believe we should intervene. As long as we get trade, um, he's interested in trade, but he doesn't want to intervene um, in terms of any human rights violations, which is very similar to China, which you know, will make cultural arguments for some of the most horrifying things that shouldn't actually be cultural arguments. And that's a lot to do with NATO because the um, union of NATO allows the enforcement of UN uh, declarations and policies as well, which do have a higher benefit for trade because if you can have social contract within reasonable certainty, you can trade more often and more expensively because people are willing to take more risks. They believe in the system. Um, and that's what the Soviet states that had left the Union saw as well, and Ukraine and Poland just saw that when you don't have the certainty that justice will occur, people don't invest and they're afraid and they back off and corruption happens really fast and before every, you know, everybody's broke. So um, it really would not be fun right now to be Ukraine or Poland because even though you see that corruption leads to things being broke, you also see ethnicism a real ethnicism still from Germany. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they agree with it. It's just which of the two is better. Um, and I think that these states genuinely want democracy. Why? Because um, they are people <laughs> who want to have a voice. And if you have a voice, um, you're going to do better economically. You're going to do better personally. Um, it's naturally attractive to have democracy. Now, whether or not a democracy is real, um, then that gets back again to the quality and the way in which um, you know freedom of speech is enforced. Things that will destroy democracy is abuse of discretion, which means a judge says, you know, I I'm going to judge that you can take a million dollars, and you say why? Um, they say because I, I'm a judge, I'm not gonna have discretion. And then you go to the AOC, which is the administrative court and say, hey, this judge abused their discretion. They say, no, they didn't. That's not abuse of discretion, right? Because they didn't look into it. They just said, oh, that's a judge. It's our judge. It's good to go. That's one thing that will destroy an economy pretty fast. And then another thing that will destroy it is um, what lawfare. So lawfare is the idea that and this is how kings used to act back in the day, which is patently not democratic. <laughs> they used to take law and they used to use it to um, subjugate people. So instead of what is supposed to happen with law is you have, um, you take something that happens and you immediately, you take something that happens and you take it on its face and you say, okay, you got this far, you want us to resolve this in a way that re reintroduces social contract. People say order, but order doesn't mean anything. What we mean when we say order is social contract, right? Um, a police that comes in into your house and destroys everything you own um, in order to achieve order, that isn't order. But when you look at it at social contract, you can see that they violated the social contract you have that you will not have your things violated. You will not have your space violated. And that's why you interact with them at all from a position of trust. Uh, you can see that that's the real thing that you are reestablishing when you say you reestablish order. So essentially um, lawfare will destroy 
what is supposed to be a uh, defensive reinstatement of the social contract by making an offensive use of the law that was created to be a defensive use of reinstating social contract and making it into an offensive where people over survey to catch people doing things which is called entrapment and create a case that um, then they can you know arbitrarily bring to the court and say oh yeah this is this thing it acts like it was defense when it was very clearly offense and use what we call police of use of tools so um uh lawfare is another thing that can destroy an economy really fast and it's really important to know the difference between justice and lawfare because lawfare it looks like justice but it is not justice why because it has elements of entrapment it has elements of maliciousness. Um, malicious is often cited in, in uh, prosecutorial law code as something that is the uh, the deciding factor between what is and isn't a crime. And then we also have, um, we also have the fact that it is uh, entrapping. So entrapment is creating a case um, in order to make an innocent uh, criminal which is not the point of the law system. We're not trying to generate criminals. We are trying to identify if someone is or isn't a criminal given the facts once it comes to the court. So in an entrapment case, they would come to the court and it's just a mockery of justice because the entrapment clearly has assumed that they are a criminal and they have made it so. Um, that's not what it's about. Anything that has a predetermined case is not actually justice and that is lawfare. So those things were happening um, under the centralized structures like the Soviet Union and they didn't lead to collapse. They are not sustainable <laughs> features. You can ask anybody who um, went through that time period, um, um, at least most of them. We'll say that those are not sustainable features and they're actually highly, highly traumatizing unless you're in the you're in the uh, the party of Higgs, as they call it, which is the people that benefit from the oligarchy. So um, we keep going and we see all of our good old Carnap. We're not going to go too much into that. Um, but I also do want to quickly touch on um, what we see here. So the box is your necessary, your necessary and your brackets are your diamond. And what this says is the necessary is in the possible. Or, sorry, the possible is in the necessary. So even though that sounds like something is possible and is nested in all that is necessary, which to anybody might be a little bit confusing. Um, So the diamond is in the box and necessary is in the possible. I mean, sorry, the possible is in the necessary. Um, you might be like, oh, if it's possible, it's necessary. So all things are necessary. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, what we're saying is if it's, it is possible, it is necessarily possible. So and it's kind of um, the same as when you say, uh, is it possible that Ukraine will join NATO? Uh, yeah, it's possible. So is it is therefore necessarily possible? Um, you can't say it is unnecessarily possible because you already established it was possible by having a coherent thought about it. Um, so is it possible that Trump will become president? It is possible. Is it necessary? No. Is it necessarily possible that Trump will become president? Uh, yeah, it's necessarily possible because I can think of it. Um, and there's a lot of things pointing to that. So then now you can do what they say is um, creating an argument that has a precedent and an antecedent. So those are your if then statements. Um, and then you can determine the necessity of any antecedent by uh, using this logic. And the goal is to establish 
whether or not the antecedent is necessary without affecting um, the precedent, right? So why don't we want to affect the precedent? Well, let's first even talk about what precedent and antecedent are. So what we have here is, um, uh, that's not too helpful. Let's see if we have one. This is what we want. So if you're like, hey, that looks like math. Logic is, uh, there's a whole kind of theory of math. This is a lot, math is actually logic in the end. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very analytical. And we take a look and we have A, B, or A, or B. So antecedent, sorry, yeah, antecedent usually means before scratch what I said about precedent. I am getting confused. Uh, antecedent is before and the consequent is after. So A, B, A, then B. So if I have a, um, if I know that Trump, let's say I have a world where Trump becomes president, then let's say I have a consequent of then NATO, uh, Ukraine joins NATO. Is it, is it necessary? Is there a necessary consequence there? Does it necessarily have to happen? Or is it just possible? Um, well, at this point, both of them are just possible. But what we do is we take a world and we assume it to be true. And then we decide, is it possible in that world? So then we say, um, yeah, so in this world that Trump becomes president again, does Ukraine join NATO? Or is it necessary that Ukraine joins NATO or is it merely possible? For it to be necessary, you have to t uh, tie um, Ukraine uh, joining NATO to Trump's election, right? Um, so the only way that that would be the case is in those pretty tragic corrupt deals that happen where you know Trump was like, hey, if you do this for me, I'll give you aid that you need. Um, now here's the thing is if Trump becomes president because Ukraine isn't getting aid, then will Trump uh, will Ukraine join NATO? Probably not. Um, so the question then is, if Trump becomes president, will he betray the reason that it looks like he's getting elected, which is to betray Ukraine? Um, so if Trump isn't necessary that Trump betrays the GOP, like he has done over and over and over, and the GOP has not learned. Um, uh, is there anything necessary to his betrayals? Well, the only reason he would do that is if he can establish a point of necessity between Trump being elected and um, and him needing to support Ukraine once elected, right? Um, so. If the GOP's money is being majority backed by Western money, or if it's being majority backed by Russian money, um, that depends. Because if it's backed by Western money, no way is the West going to let Trump just um, ignore Ukraine. So if Trump in the case that the GOP is majority backed by Europe and Trump becomes president, then Ukraine will very likely join NATO. It's still not necessary, right? Um, but 
let's take a look at what I did there. I did add a lot to the original antecedent. I added a lot of details like who funded who. Um, and that's something you want to avoid when you're doing um, modal logic. You want to avoid adding a lot of details to your antecedent. You just want to see what are direct consequences. Um, so those are definitely things that we might see later, but I just wanted to give an uh, application for Waldo logic, um, and it's based in uh, Ukraine, uh, very relevant. Because when I was learning this, I did not see anything relevant about it. <laughs> it's like, okay, worlds we can talk about, um, fantasy we can talk about, all that good stuff, but what about something that I can do with it? And using this, I can achieve a pretty strong sense of what will and will not happen. So people ask me, like, how did you get X, Y, Z right? And all those kind of things. It's because of my training with this. So um, you can pretty much establish what, what things will be necessary or not. And that's metaphysics because this is all the future, right? But it's using the logic of necessity and possibility to kind of get a strong sense of what could and couldn't happen. Um, so I think for now, I'm just going to end it there and then we'll probably go through the rest of the, we'll probably go through the rest of the paper later. But um, for now, that is the application of modal logic from our paper between the time of physics and um, between the time of physics and the time of metaphysics, the time of tense logic. Uh, and then we have debating the war in Ukraine, counterfactual disputes, which is counterfactual means against fact, which is metaphysical. Um, and it is using that logic of possibility and necessity. So um, I think that's going to be a stop share for now. And this is for the cauldron, um, doing it for Ukraine too. So um, thumbs up to Biden for supporting Ukraine. Thank you, Biden. Um, and if we can make sure that we keep an eye on China, that would be great too. Um, but mainly here for Ukraine. Because if you um, have no choice and people are, are saying, well, why can't you just lose a limb so that I can not hear any more news about Ukraine? Um, you know, you're, you're just heartbreaks when you hear someone say that. When somebody says to you, you know what, you just, just lose a limb so I can not be inconvenienced by hearing about this war anymore. It's like, like Zelensky said, he said, that's insane. Um, I'm not going to lose a limb so that you can feel comfortable. Um, and that the war isn't on. So you can be like a hippie. I'm not gonna lose a limb so that you can you can be like a hippie because that is a false hippie, right? If you really are somebody who's peace loving, you want an end to people that constantly wage war and even if they get everything they want, will want more and more and more, right? So um, Team Zelensky all the way, uh, he's not, He's not blood hungry. He is doing the right thing, protecting his country. Um, I'm here for Ukraine, but I thank him for what he's doing for Europe too. But my heart goes out to them. I'm part Polish. <laughs> so my heart goes out to them. And uh, we'll probably get through the rest of it in a second here. So have a good night, guys. And cats are hanging out. I don't think they want to be bothered, but they are not fighting. They are now sleeping together again. Okay, so uh, have a good night. Um, join the cauldron. It's our meetup. Okay. Bye.